Hello, I'm Stephanie Flanders, head of Bloomberg Economics. I'm delighted to be here today with Penelope Penny Goldberg, chief economist of the World Bank, who will be delivering the IFS annual lecture. She's also on the panel for Inequality, the IFS Deaton Review. Penny Goldberg, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Penny, I guess we should start with the basic question, although uh, you know, it's simple to say, not necessarily easy to answer. Mm. Has globalization been a good thing for the world? Definitely, yes. Uh, globalization has been a good thing for the world, uh, I would say both for advanced economies, but especially for developing countries. Uh, this is a point that I would like to emphasize, especially as chief economist of the World Bank Group. Many developing countries, especially the small ones, could not possibly go grow without trade and without being exposed to the forces of globalization. Um, one of the greatest achievements of the last 20, 30 years is the reduction, the drastic reduction in extreme poverty. And uh, this would not have been achieved without globalization. But I would say also in advanced economies, the effects have been positive in the aggregate. Uh, that said, it's a, a very old insight of trade theory of economics that globalization, that trade, generate winners and losers. So while the aggregate effects have been positive, uh, they have been uneven across the population, they have been uneven across countries, they have been uneven within countries, across regions within a country, across people with different skills. Um, and so when we think about globalization, while keeping in mind that it's a positive development, we should also be aware of the fact that there are distributional consequences. You said at the start that globalization had been uh, a good thing, but we know that there were winners and losers. And I think I guess buried in there was a sense that we hadn't maybe, country by country, had not been good enough at uh, compensating uh, the losers. Mm -hmm. Maybe governments hadn't focused on that enough. What kind of policies uh, should a, a right-thinking government now be looking at if it wants to maintain support for globalization but take more seriously those, mm -hmm. those losers, that distributional consequence? So uh, the important new insight of recent research uh, has been that the spatial dimension is very important. In retrospect, this is not that surprising. If you Place, think about it, the place, important. the place. Uh, that the effects are, fe are felt uh, at specific locations. In the aggregate, the effects may be minuscule, uh, but they're, fe they're felt very strongly in particular places that, that are affected by trade. And this is actually something that has been documented for developing countries. Uh, a few years ago, again and again, people were finding that for India, for Vietnam, for Brazil, um, but it didn't receive much attention, you know, partly I would say because economics ten tends to be very much US focused and UK focused, but also partly because all these economies were growing. So yes, some regions were affected more than others by trade, but overall it was a positive story. In the US and U the UK to a certain extent, the, the story has been different. Manufacturing employment has been declining uh, very rapidly in the last few decades for many reasons, not just because of trade, uh, but then the recent import surge from, from China intensified this trend, and the effects were very uneven across regions, across uh, different localities. So this is the big insight that recent research has had, and it also has shown that this has important implications, not just for income, but also for education, for crime, for public policies in, this, in these communities. So what this, um, uh, the question that this raises is that perhaps we should think our stance on place-based policies. And place-based policies is something that most economists uh, consider uh, completely undesirable. They are, they, are con they are considered distortionary, and in many cases they are. However, what, what recent research has documented is that people are not as mobile as we thought. Uh, for some reason, they're not willing to leave the areas that are hit hard and move towards areas that are prospering. Eventually, they do that, but not soon enough. So um, that raises the question whether we shouldn't rethink uh, place-based policies and whether there is not um, a new justification for them. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So, so, so that, 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 that's one, one kind of policy. Um, there are many others. I mean, there have been many uh, proposals to tailor uh, policies to those who are most affected by globalization by offering uh, relocation assistance or retraining. The evidence on retraining tends to be very mixed. Um, it sounds very good, but in practice, retraining programs have not delivered. Um, some might argue because the, the scale is still very limited. They need to be scaled up. So, so these are, by the, by the way, these are all questions that the DITON review <laughs> intends to investigate. Um, I think we're at the point where we have a pretty good diagnosis of the problem. And now we are at the point where we need to come up with solutions. Um, and that, that will still take some time. But if we haven't got solutions, I mean, I hear this a lot. I, mean, I, was actually, I chaired an inclusive growth commission here in the UK that was working with cities and coming to much the same inclusion, which was also against my sort of uh, background, thinking of looking in terms of cities and towns rather than national uh, policies. But as you say yourself, we don't have the solutions. And if we don't have uh, the clear tools for making globalization work for everyone, as opposed to just profiting a small number, should we continue, should economists and institutions like the World Bank continue to support um, open markets and globalization if we have no way of ensuring that we're gonna get those benefits to everybody? So, so two points here, so first, I need to emphasize that the World Bank, the, the priority of the World Bank is to reduce poverty and, uh, and uh, provide a way for shared prosperity across the world. And no matter what you think about how globalization has affected advanced economies, there is no doubt that globalization has helped developing countries. So from my point of view, the answer is very easy. When, when I sit at the World Bank and you're asking me if globalization is desirable, my answer is an unambiguous yes, because from the point of view of developing countries, uh, this is the obvious way to grow. Uh, but even in developing countries, the effects of globalization has been uneven. So this doesn't mean that we should not be worried about inclusive well, growth. And places and so like on. Brazil and India, where actually liberalization exactly. has cost a lot of jobs no, and uh, hurt uh, some Exactly, I'm, 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 I fully agree with that. But in developing countries, it would be a huge mistake to say stay away from globalization because this seriously interferes with their growth. In, in, more, in the advanced uh, part of the world, it's a different story. Definitely the message that people sent uh, in the last few years is we need a break. I, I wouldn't go as far as saying that people are asking explicitly for protectionism. So if you examine what the responses are in, um, in uh, surveys of public attitudes, most people still think trade is a good thing. <laughs> um, globalization is a good thing, but, but there is demand for addressing its negative consequences on certain parts of the population. Think about those criticisms, the call for a pause from lots of different quarters, also some, some technologies which are reducing the importance or the value of having these very elaborate supply chains around the world. Do you think as an academic looking back that the first decade of the 21st century will look like peak globalization, that we never really were more globalized than we were then. But now, then we are. If we're looking back, do you think we will say that was the this peak. was this was the peak of globalization for all these different reasons? Um, I, I'll give you an honest answer. If you if you had asked me this question a year ago, I would have said no. Um, so when the trade tensions started uh, rising many of us drew parallels to what had happened in the late 80s and in the 90s with Japan. There were many similarities. Again, <coughs> Japan was rising. There were many concerns that workers in the United States were displaced, in particular industries, especially the automobile industry. There was a rise in protectionism. There were many concerns about market access. Um, people even used exactly the same language to describe the situation. And what happened actually is um, there was a very short break. There was a rise in protectionism. And then we had the WTO, we had global value chains, we had the hyper-globalization of the 90s and globalization went on steroids. So my first reaction uh, 
last year was that maybe we're experiencing, we're experiencing exactly the same thing. Now with China, not with Japan. And this is ju just a short break. And eventually we'll return back to the old path. I'm not so sure anymore. I think perhaps we are at a turning point. Um, it's hard to tell. Uh, but I do think that there are some elements that make the current situation very different from what happened with Japan. One of them is the sheer size of China. It's a huge country. Uh, the developing world is not where it was in the 80s or 90s. There are many countries rising. Uh, I do think that the current tensions are to a certain extent the defining feature of our society in the sense that it's no longer, I think, just about inequality or just about being a liberal or conservative or being in favor of big or, or small government. There is a fundamental question whether we're embracing a global environment, an open world, with all the challenges this brings. It brings many benefits, but each of us is now competing at a global scale with everyone, with millions of people across the world. That puts an awful lot of pressure on people. So are we willing to embrace that? Or do we think it's better to turn inwards and focus on our own countries? I think we're at this important turning point. And the policy choices that we make in the next few years are going to be quite important. Professor Penny Goldberg, uh, thank you very much uh, for talking to me. Thank you.